Let's begin by offering our respects to the founder Acharya of ISKCON, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Okay, so what did we see in the previous class? We saw chapter 16. Yes, we the saw divine, the divine and the demoniac natures. Yeah, divine and demoniac natures. Okay, so what did we see in the chapter? In the beginning of the chapter, Krishna is explaining how many transcendental qualities? 26. Exactly, yes, 26. So Krishna begins the chapter by explaining 26 divine qualities and we went how far? Which was the last quality we saw? Mm. I'm not sure actually. I remember we saw almost all of them. Almost all of them. No. Tyaga. We saw until uh, Akrodha. Akrodha, yes. We saw until freedom from anger. So we have, like we've covered 12 uh, qualities out of the 26. So today we have to start from renunciation. Tyaga. Tyaga. So for that, please repeat. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Okay, let's uh, again hear this these three verses before we start. Atha Shoda Shodhyaya Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Abhayam Sattva Sam Shudhir Jnana Yoga Vyavasthiti Danam Damascha Yajyascha Swadhyaya Stapa Arjavam Ahimsa Satya Makrodha Tyaga Shanti Rapaishunam Daya Bhute Shvalolupvam Mardavam Hira Chapalam Teja Kshamadhriti Shaucham Adroho nati manita Bhavanti sampadam devim Abhijatasya bharata Okay, so who would like to read today? I don't mind reading. Oh. Okay, what would you like to read? Uh, I would like the translations, please. Okay, and who would like to read the other text? I can go for it, Mataji. Okay, thank you. Can we read the translation? Uh, okay, from the full? Like yes. the full? Okay. Yes. The Supreme Personality of God had said, fearlessness, purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, 
study of the Vedas, austerity, simplicity, non-violence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault finding, compassion for all living entities, freedom from co covetousness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, and freedom from envy and from the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, O son of Bharata, belong to godly men endowed with divine nature. Okay, so in the previous class, we discussed also uh, the use of this word Abhijatasya, one who was born of these qualities. So the child in the womb already has either divine or demoniac uh, qualities, natures. It's not that after the child is uh, all grown up and then as a child or as the child is growing, uh, the, these qualities are developed. Already the child in the womb is born of these qualities. Again, depending on the previous lifetime of this particular living entity. Okay, so we have to discuss from uh, renunciation, Tyaga. So what does renunciation really mean? Renunciation doesn't mean that we have to leave our house, leave our family, leave our, give up our responsibilities. No, renunciation simply means that we have to use whatever we have in the service of Krishna. That is renunciation. So whether we have wealth, uh, money, beauty, uh, power, uh, fame, whatever it may be, we have to use it in the service of the Lord. That is renunciation, not use it for our own sense gratification. Of course, we use uh, whatever we need to keep the body and soul together because we have to survive, we have to protect our service. That doesn't, that also is not for your own personal sense gratification. We are, we are uh, using it to take care of our services because the primary owner of this body is Krishna. We are only the secondary owners of this body. So therefore, renunciation simply means using everything in the service of Krishna. What is the next quality? Tranquility. Tranquility. Shanti, isn't it here? Say Shanti, tranquility. Yeah. So Shanti, tranquility means that even though a, a devotee uh, faces so many obstacles, so many disturbing situations in his spiritual life, still he is equipoised, still he is tranquil, still he is um, he, he's, he doesn't get hassled by uh, disturbances in his spiritual life. What's the next quality? Aversion to fault finding. Aversion Apai to shunam. Aversion to Apai shunam. fault finding. So um, we see usually that people who gossip, the gossip mongers, they get a lot of joy by finding fault with others or simply accusing others. Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that it's okay to call a thief a thief. If somebody is a thief, you call him a thief. That's fine. But unnecessarily, we should not point fingers at others. A devotee does not uh, uh, derive any joy from gossiping or from finding fault uh, with others. A devotee derives joy when the Lord is glorified or when the devotees of the Lord is when the devotees of the Lord are glorified. Yeah, let's read this. Don't point fingers. Move fingers on prayer beats. The Gita teaches that aversion to fall finding characterizes the godly. 16.2 How does this apply to us in our routine interactions with others when their infractions are minor and their intentions aren't malicious? Gita wisdom explains that when well-intentioned people uncharacteristically hurt us, they may be functioning as instruments of our own karma, if giving them the consequences of their actions is not our dharma, then we will do well to let the infractions pass and focus on our own spiritual evolution. The best way to focus thus is by cultivating devotion for our all attractive Lord Krishna. Devotion gives us the most fulfilling object for contemplation thus offering us a healthier, 
happier alternative to choking in resentment. So when faced with problems, we can replace our default pointing fingers at others with conscious with conscientious moving of our fingers on our prayer beads. By thus connecting with Krishna, we can outgrow resentment and respond to the problem wisely. So sometimes if we, we, if we feel that a certain person or a certain group of people, they are troubling us, we, uh, how does a devotee understand this? A devotee, instead of pointing fingers at somebody else and saying that this person is causing me problems, a devotee um, sees it like this. He sees it that maybe I have troubled this person in my previous lifetime. And therefore, now I'm only getting a taste of my own karma. Just as how if, um, if, somebody, if somebody robs something and the object that he has stolen, uh, he has kept in his house. And the next day that is stolen from his house. So now this thief cannot uh, complain uh, because what was stolen was something that he only had stolen from somebody else, isn't it? So there is nothing much that he can do about it. Therefore, um, when when people when we feel that we are being troubled or hassled, it's because of our own karma. And if we understand it like that, then we will not be um, so hassled. So what is the solution to this? When we chant the holy name, we are burning our past karma. So that way we can reduce our suffering. So it's better to move fingers on the prayer beads rather than waste time pointing fingers at others. With regard to this, uh, Srila Prabhupada also explains the bee mentality versus the fly mentality. The fly always um, is attracted to dirty, filthy uh, uh, places where there is trash and there is filth. Whereas the bee is always attracted by the nectar in the flowers. You will never see a bee in dirty, filthy places. And you will not see a fly being attracted to the nectar of the flowers. In the same way, a devotee is always attracted by the good qualities of the others. A devotee sees only the good qualities in others. Whereas a gossiper will only be finding fault. He is attracted and he, he derives joy by finding fault and by gossiping about the others. So B mentality versus the fly mentality. So we can see uh, ourselves, uh, if we are more attracted to gossip and if we are more attracted to uh, talking bad about the others or hearing uh, gossip about the others, then it means we have the mentality of a fly. But if we feel that we, we are able to appreciate the good qualities in the others, if we, are, we derive joy when we hear a devotee being appreciated, then we have the mentality of a bee. Let's read this. The difference between a devotee and a non-devotee is just like the bee and the fly. The bee is always attracted by the honey and fly goes to the open source. So the devotee is only attracted by the good qualities in other people and does not see their faults. Okay. Let's go back to our translation. What's the next quality? Daya, mercy. Daya, mercy. So daya bhuteshu means mercy toward all the living entities. Not only mercy towards the other human beings, but towards all living entities. A devotee does not want to harm even a small ant. Actually, mercy is one of the four pillars of religion. There are four pillars of religion. Satyam, tapa, saucham, and daya. Truthfulness, austerity, cleanliness, and mercy. And there are four regulated principles, no meat eating, no intoxication, no illicit sex and no gambling. The reason why we have to follow these four principles is these four principles help that these pillars are intact. When we break one of these regulated principles, then we are breaking the pillars of religion. And um, without the four pillars, then religion cannot be standing firm. Just as how if you have a table with four legs, if one leg is not there of the, of the table, then the table will not be able to stand properly, isn't it? So therefore, uh, dharma means we have to keep all the four pillars of religion intact. Now, if we engage in meat eating, which, which, which of the four pillars are we breaking? Mercy. Mercy, daya, isn't it? Because where is the mercy? If we are, if we are 
uh, slaughtering animals or we are eating meat just to satisfy our taste buds, then where is the question of having compassion for the other living entities? Intoxication, which pillar does intoxication break? Se uh, tapa. Tapa, self-discipline. So um, if we want to engage in having intoxicants, whiskey, wine, or cigarette smoking, or tea and coffee, tea and coffee is also considered to be intoxicant, because if we don't have any of these intoxicants, then our head starts to pain, our eyes start to water, you know, in extreme cases, the person starts to behave violently until the person doesn't get the cup of tea. So this, uh, these cases we have seen. So, but self-discipline means I will not engage in all this because this is not good for my sadhana. Anything that is a, an addiction will come in the way of my sadhana. So therefore we should have some self-discipline and not engage in any kinds of, any kind of intoxication. Illicit sex breaks which of the four principles? According to me, it's two pillars here, tapa and saucham. Saucham, okay, but uh, yes, you can apply it there, but generally illicit sex breaks the principle of purity hmm? mm -hmm. because um, engaging in, in uh, sexual activities for one's own sense gratification uh, beyond what Shastra recommends, that breaks the uh, pillar of purity. And no gambling breaks the pillar of Satyam. Satyam or honesty. All these gambling houses are designed to cheat. No gambling house has gone bankrupt till today because no gambling house is designed in such a way that the person who's playing can win. Ultimately, it's always a gambling house which is um, which is making money, isn't it? So gambling breaks the pillar of truthfulness. So coming to Daya or uh, mercy for all the living entities, a devotee shows mercy to the soul because giving, showing mercy to the soul is more important than showing mercy to the body. If we show mercy to the body by doing some social service, feeding the poor, giving them some shelter, how long will it last? Hmm? That kind of mercy to the body will last a few hours, a few days, maximum till the person's lifetime, we can help the person. But beyond that, only if we show mercy to the soul by distributing books, by giving them transcendental knowledge, by getting them in touch with a devotee association or by somehow or the other engaging them in devotional service, then we show mercy to the soul. And that the person can carry on to the next lifetime. And it's not wasted. Okay, what's the next quality? Freedom from greed. Freedom Alo. from greed. Alo Luktvam. So freedom from greed, again, is very important uh, transcendental quality. By when we engage in uh, charity, dhanam, then automatically we will be getting freedom from greed. Why? Because a person who's greedy, what is his mentality? He wants to accumulate more and more and more for himself. But when we have the habit of giving away, so when we engage in charity, then the uh, this quality of greed can be controlled to that extent. Because he has developed the habit of giving, then to that extent, the greed can come down. Next quality. Mardavam. Gentleness. Yes, gentleness or Mardavam. A, a devotee is very gentle with other living entities and he's also very gentle in his dealings any kind of dealings. He's not harsh. He's very, very gentle. Uh, see, like, for example, Yudhishthir Maharaj, uh, one of his name is Ajata Shatru. Ajata Shatru means he has no enemies because he was very gentle with others. Even one of Lord Shiva's names is Nirvairam. Nirvairam means he has no wear. He has no enmity with anyone. Another of Lord Shiva's names is Shanta Vigraham. Shanta Vigraham means he has a very pers peaceful personality. So normally Lord Shiva Who's, who's the topmost Vaishnava, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam explains Lord Shiva as Vaishnavanam Yatha Shambhu. He is the topmost Vaishnava. So we can see even though Lord Shiva is in charge of destruction, that is the service that is given to Lord Shiva, 
still he is actually very peaceful he is very uh, cool calm and collected by nature so a devotee is gentle next modesty riha yeah so modesty a devotee is also very modest he doesn't take credit for whatever uh, services he does or whatever he can achieve in his spiritual life let's say somebody has distributed uh, is the number one book distributor and his his tally of book distribution is the highest in his count for that month okay so he will not say oh yes i am a very good book distributor therefore i have distributed so many books now what does he say by the mercy of my guru maharaj by the mercy of krishna i was able to distribute so many books so devotee never takes credit for his spiritual services or his um, accomplishments he always gives credit to guru and krishna next determination determination achapalam so determination a, a devotee is determined he moves ahead he moves forward despite um, he may despite the fact that sometimes he may face failure sometimes he may be um, he may not get the kind of success that he wants let's say he wants to distribute so many books but for some reason or the other he is not able to distribute or he is trying to do some services but he is not able to do it so irrespective of um, of the fact that he may face some failures still he goes ahead with uh, determination he stays focused and he progresses on the path next teja or bigger yeah teja of bigger so this prabhupad explains is especially for the kshatriyas we discussed in the previous class how these qualities all these 26 transcendental qualities are for everyone but within the varnashram system some qualities are more specifically for a certain varna or for a certain ashrama so what we discussed today is for everyone and uh, uh, teja vigar shila prabhupad explains is for everyone but more uh, specifically for the kshatriyas because it is the duty of the kshatriya to have teja uh, it's important to have teja of vigar because it is his duty to protect the residents within his kingdom and to protect his kingdom so in the in order to protect the people sometimes he may have to use violence so therefore um, it's important that kshatriyas have teja of vigar for a kshatriya um not to use violence where he has to use violence then he is failing in his duties so that is not a transcendental quality if he is showing non violence at a place when he, where he should show violence then it is a demoniac quality he has to show violence at points where he where it's important to be violent for example let's say if uh, if there is some kind of protest and uh, some some protesters are behaving very harsh and they are actually beating up other innocent people on the road and then the police arrives over there and the police says that oh i cannot arrest uh, these mischief makers because i believe in non violence i like to be i like to be shanti tranquil and i don't want to use force and prevent them from doing whatever they want to do what are we going to call such a policeman we are going to say you are failing in your duty because here he has to apply force and he has to prevent the mischief makers from creating more mischief isn't it so non violence has to be applied in certain place time and circumstances failing to apply violence in where it needs to be applied then that means it is a demoniac quality for a kshatriya Shila Prabhupad said that violence and non-violence both have their respective places, and always non-violence is nonsense. Non-violence, Shila Prabhupad said. Just like how in even in the even in the war, many people uh, question why is it why did Krishna incite Arjuna to fight the war and cause the death of so many living entities? They always have this problem. They say, "Oh, the Bhagavad Gita is full of violence. So much of bloodshed. So many people were killed. So many stalwart devotees were killed." But then, if if Krishna had not incited Arjuna and Duryodhan had had was crowned king, what would have followed in the kingdom? would there have been peace and tranquil in the kingdom after duryodhan is crowned king is there going to be dharma that is going to be followed after duryodhan is crowned king what is going to no. be 
Yeah, definitely not. Isn't uh-huh. it? That's the reason why that it was very important that Krishna incited Arjuna and Arjuna fought the war so that these mischief makers, the Kauravas are moved out and they are not crowned kings. So therefore, for the establishment of peace, that war was important. Okay, what's the next quality? Shama. Forgiveness. Um, forgiveness. This also, Prabhupada explains, is more for the Kshatriyas. Now, because a Kshatriya has power, because a Kshatriya ha- is the king, uh, he should be uh, willing to be able to forgive the minor offenses of the people. Sometimes maybe it's some very minor offense is being committed. And still, if the king is all puffed up because of his power and position, and he may be proud, for minor offenses also, he may give out a punishment that is too harsh. But no, it's the duty of a Kshatriya to forgive minor offenses. Okay, next. Fortitude. Fortitude or Dritti. This also, uh, Srila Prabhupada explains is especially for the Kshatriya. So they, fortitude means they are brave, they are resilient, they have the courage. They are also mentally very, very uh, resilient the kshatriyas because it's not easy for uh, for one to say like let's take arjuna how much uh, mentally strong he had to be to fight that war he's facing weapons he's facing death when a kshatriya goes to fight he doesn't know whether he's going to come back alive isn't it so it requires a lot of uh, mental courage also to be able to go on the battlefield and uh, be there in the midst of uh, of of dangers of danger to life is there and for arjuna to face all those um, deadly weapons those kind of atomic weapons and that too um, in front of those people that he loves the most it requires a lot of mental resilience so this also is especially for the kshatriyas then next so sacham clean, cleanliness yeah, shaucham or cleanliness. So cleanliness are of two types, internal and external. Internal cleanliness, the mind and the heart should be clean. And external cleanliness, a devotee is uh, external clean. He, his body is clean. He shaves, right? The hair is clean. Taking a bath regularly, the body is clean. And also he is clean in his dealings with the people. Next. Freedom from envy. Adroha. Freedom Adra. from envy, adroha. So a devotee he is not resentful of another person. He is free from envy. Envy is a very, very dangerous uh, quality. In, remember, the, the reason why we are here in this material world is because we were envious of the position of the Lord. Therefore, we are here. So envy is the reason why we are here. And therefore, a devotee is free from envy. Let's see some quotes from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Should I read? Yes, please. Srimad Bhagavatam 4.7 uh, verse 32. King Indra said, My dear Lord, your transcendental form with eight hands and weapons in each of them appears for the welfare of the entire universe. And it is very pleasing to the mind and eyes. In such a form, your Lordship is always prepared to punish the demons who are envious of your devotees. Srimad Bhagavatam 7.4 verse 27, Narada speaks to Yudhishthar. When one is envious of the demigods who represent the Supreme Personality of Godhead of the Vedas, which give all knowledge of the cows, Brahmanas, Vaishnavas and religious principles and ultimately of me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he and his civilization will be vanquished without delay. Srimad Bhagavatam 7.14 verse 40, Narada speaks to Yudhishthir. Sometimes a neophyte devotee offers all the paraphernalia for worshipping the Lord and he factually worships the Lord as the deity. But because he is envious of the authorized devotees of Lord Vishnu, the Lord is never satisfied with his devotional service. So just see, even if a devotee, especially the last one, how strong, a devotee may be a pujari. He is offering all paraphernalia for worshipping the Lord. 
and he's worshiping the Lord as a deity, but still, if he's envious of the Lord or of the devotees of the Lord, he the Lord is never satisfied with his devotional service. So even though he's engaged in serving or worshiping the deity, if he's envious of the devotees, then the Lord is not going to be satisfied with his devotional service. So the relationship between the devotee and the Lord is that the Lord cannot tolerate that the devotees are blasphemed and the devotees cannot tolerate that the Lord is blasphemed. So the, if one is envious of the Lord, even if he's engaged in devotional service, still the Lord will not be satisfied with his devotional service. Very strong. Okay. What's the next quality? It's written no, not now. Uh huh. Not so, na, na, not expectation of honor. Exactly. Na ati manita. Mana means honor. So na ati manita. He does not expect any honor. A devotee of the Lord, he can um, accept. If somebody respects this person, he can accept the respect. But he cannot demand respect. He does not demand any respect because he is equipoised in honor and dishonor. Whether somebody honors him or somebody dishonors him, somebody appreciates him, somebody criticizes him, he still remains equipoised. So he is not expecting anyone to give him any kind of honor. But if somebody honors him, somebody respects him, then he, he can accept it. So with this, we end the 26 transcendental qualities. Then Krishna ends by saying that, Uh, these transcendental qualities, or son of Bharata, belong to godly men endowed with divine nature. So that's where Krishna says, Abhijatasya, one is endowed or one is born of these divine qualities. Coming to this, I forgot to mention one point. Where is that? Yeah, freedom from envy. Usually envy is when we see, um, there are two kinds of envy actually. One is if, if I have one house and somebody else has two, then I feel envious because that person has more than me. That is one. And the other is irrespective of how many houses I may have, if the other person has even one house, then I'm envious of the person. So the second one is more dangerous than the first one. But either way, whichever kind of envy one may be experiencing, it's um, each one is getting a certain comfort or a certain lifestyle or certain kind of suffering, depending on uh, the extent of one's material disease. If one is more materially diseased, then one has to go through that much more suffering for the sake of being purified. So I cannot question that. Why is it that I cannot enjoy as comfortably as my neighbor? Because it's as absurd as saying that why is it that the doctor has prescribed medicines to me for seven days, but he has prescribed medicine to somebody else for only two days. The doctor is going to prescribe medicines according to the extent of one's disease, isn't it? So in the same way, to the extent of our material disease, we have to go through that kind of treatment, that kind of purification within the Varnashram system. So for us to go through that purification, then we have to uh, have that much of suffering or that much of struggle in our material existence. Okay, now Krishna, uh, after he enlists 26 transcendental qualities, he is going to enlist the demoniac qualities in verse 4. Let's hear. Dambho darpo bhimanas cha krodha parushya mevacha Agyanam cha vijatasya patha sampada masurim. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those demoniac nature, those of demoniac nature, O son of Paratha. So here Krishna is describing the royal road to hell. He's giving us six demoniac qualities. Let's read the point from the book. 
text 16.14, six demoniac qualities. The verse, this verse describes the royal road to hell. Focus of learning, purport 16.4. Importance of the word abhijatsya. These qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers. As they grow, they manifest all inauspicious qualities. Demoniac qualities. First, pride. Demoniac want to make a show of religion and advancement in spiritual science, but do not follow the principles. Second, arrogance. Proud in possessing some education or wealth and thus arrogant. Third, conceit. Desire to be worshipped by others. Demand respect, but do not command respect. Fourth, anger. Over trifles, they become angry. Fifth, harshness. Speak harshly. Sixth, ignorance. Not knowing what to do and what not to do. Do all whimsically according to their own desire. Do not recognize any authority. So we see these six qualities are exact opposite of the transcendental qualities that Krishna has mentioned. So these are the uh, six uh, qualities that lead us to hell. Now see this last one, ignorance, not knowing what to do and what not to do, do all whimsically according to their own desire. So they have no regard for Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. They come up with their own rules and regulations. This is a this is a disease that we have, especially now in the modern age. There is no regard for Shastra. Everybody says, okay, I feel like doing this. I want to be free. So I will do what I like to do. So doing whimsically without the, um, without the authority of the Shastra or the spiritual master or the guru or the sadhu, that is nothing but ignorance. That's why majority of the population, most of them are in the modes of passion and ignorance in the current age. See, sometimes even though we may know um, Shastra, Shastra can be very bewildering. There may be points in our lifetime when we, are, we may be at a crossroads and we may not be able to decide what I should do and what I should not do. Many times I'm sure we have gone through this experience. So we have to, of course, do what Shastra says. But sometimes we may see that Shastra says that this is right. And Shastra also says that something else is right. So these two um, angle of vision, maybe they appear contradictory and both seem correct. So we may, we may not be able to decide just like Arjuna. In the first chapter, we saw Arjuna presenting some arguments as to why he does not want to fight the war. And one feels that after reading these arguments, one feels that, yes, Arjuna has a point. His, his arguments are very much valid. So Arjuna was also on this crossroads because on one side, yes, Shastra says that one should not kill a guru. Killing the guru is the greatest sin. And on the other side, uh, it's also important for him to fight the, fight the war for the establishment of peace. He's a Kshatriya and it is his duty. And so if he doesn't do that, then he's failing in his, in his duty. So like that, even Arjuna was at this crossroads. So intelligences, our intelligence may be clouded uh, and we may not be able to take a proper decision. At that time, we have to consult with a higher authority. So Arjuna did the right thing. He consulted with Krishna. Krishna was personally present. Krishna was personally pulling his chariot. Now, Krishna may not uh, be personally present for us, but definitely he is present in the form of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So therefore it's very important that when we do not know what to do, we should know what to do, which is we should know how to consult with a superior authority, a senior authority, a senior person who can give us the right kind of advice, who is a Sukhrit. Sukhrit means he is a person who has the, who will give us the right advice. Okay, he's, he, uh, he will not misguide us. He is our true friend. Nowadays, we use the word friend very loosely. You know? uh, we confuse acquaintances with friends. Our Facebook friends or our uh, all the people who are on our WhatsApp groups on our college and school or, or uh, in the city or relatives, they may be our acquaintances, but they are not necessarily our uh, intimate friends. An intimate friend is one who will give us the right advice. 
so therefore intelligence is to do to know what to do when we don't know what to do so arjuna turned to that kind of a suhrit that kind of an intimate friend he had who would give him the right advice so therefore we should also have at least one at least one suhrit one intimate friend one mentor who can give us the right advice it may be our spiritual master it can be our mentor for some people it may be the parents if the parents are devotees so it may be our elder brother or sister elder sibling so like that uh, it's important to consult with a higher authority in the case of kai kai when she was um, she took a decision that she wants ram to go to the forest and that her son should be crowned king she did not consult a higher authority and we know what followed no there was ram had to go to the forest and there was so much of confusion so therefore see kai kai uh, she was also bewildered and she uh, she did not consult higher authority if she would have consulted a higher authority at that point of time in order to help her to take a decision if she would have consulted a suhrit then uh, the course of history would have been different but of course again at the end of the day we understand that everything is uh, everything is a leela or a past time that is played out by the lord so that uh, we can learn so many lessons from the ramayana okay so these uh, six um, demoniac qualities that krishna mentions one if you can if you observe and you apply to the to the demons especially to the kauravas then you will see that these qualities so perfectly fit in for these kauravas why krishna is mentioning these qualities demoniac qualities is so that arjuna realizes that the kauravas are demoniac and they need to be um uh, killed they need to go they cannot be given the power and allowed to rule the kingdom so we know that see one of the qualities of in fact the first demoniac quality is pride and we know the saying that pride comes before the fall but the question is does pride fall let's read this article pride comes before the fall but does pride fall duryodhana repeatedly tried to destroy his cousins the pandavas driven by arrogance he resorted to increasingly devious schemes devious schemes yet through each of his attempts the pandavas emerged stronger and became exposed and uh, emerged stronger and he became exposed as evil despite such stark uh, failure he he always found some extraneous factor to blame he never acknowledged that his pride was the problem and never strove to free himself from it consequently his pride made him fall repeatedly till in the kurukshetra war it brought about his final fatal fall thankfully gita wisdom stands ready to empower us to bring about the fall of the pride within us thereby freeing us to live humbly purposefully fruitfully so we see how uh, in the case of duryodhan so many times he was actually defeated by arjuna in so many uh, different uh, Uh, occasions even before the kurukshetra war so many of his attempts were foiled and he met with failure so many times but still the pride of duryodhan did not go that pride will only go when we take to spirituality when we take to following um, the lessons from the bhagavad gita then pride will go otherwise we are not going to learn humility by any artificial means okay now so now after uh, Krishna has enlisted the transcendental qualities and the demoniac qualities. Arjuna may have a doubt. So, which category do I belong to? Because I am here in the war, and I am going. I am. I am expected to be killing. So, then, because I am going to be killing, then am I also demoniac, or am I transcendental? Where do I fall? That Krishna answers in this verse. Daivi sampadhi mokshaya nibandhaya suri mata. माशु च संपद अभिजातोसि पांडव The transcendental qualities are conductive to liberation whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage 
Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. So transcendental qualities take one higher and demonic qualities take one lower. Demonic qualities lead to bondage repeatedly, uh, taking one body after another body and being in the ocean of material existence, whereas the transcendental qualities will take one to higher and higher uh, until one reaches the spiritual realm. And then Krishna assures, he tells Arjuna that you are born with divine qualities, do not worry. So he's telling Arjuna that because Arjuna, why is it that Arjuna is not uh, demoniac, although he's going to fight and he's going to kill, is because he's not fighting out of pride or arrogance or greed. Hmm? Arjuna is fighting because it is, it is his duty as a Kshatriya to protect. And therefore he needs to protect uh, Adharma from uh, spreading and and most importantly, he's fighting under the instruction of Krishna. So it's not that both uh, Duryodhan and Arjuna are at the same, uh, have the same qualities because they are both fighting the war. No, because Arjuna, he is carefully weighing the pros and cons. Now he's, he analyzes the situation. It's not that he's fighting out of pride and arrogance or envy. In the case of Duryodhan, Duryodhan was always envious of the Pandavas. He was also greedy. He was also proud. So Arjuna is not, he does not have those qualities that Duryodhan has. So therefore Krishna assures him that you are born with divine qualities. See here in this picture, here this person surrenders to the spiritual master, he surrenders to Guru and the Guru is showing him the path and then he can, he follows the path showed by the spiritual master and he can go to the spiritual realm. Whereas on the other side, this person, he is allured by Maya. Maya is alluring him. He gets tempted. He falls for the temptation and then she drags him down. So you can see these demonic qualities here, how these things drag him down to lower and lower existence. So he's leading, going towards hellish condition of life. So that's what Krishna says here that the transcendental qualities are conducive for liberation, whereas demonic qualities make for bondage. So here, this person, divine qualities, he goes, he gets an upgrade. This person, the demonic qualities, he's getting a downgrade. Let's read the sixth. Two men standing where the stairway makes its turn. So two men are being offered both liberation and bondage. One man looks upward, following the spiritual master who points towards who points towards Sri Radha Krishna. The other man embraces the demoniac qualities by accepting the garland offered by Maya, Krishna's illusory energy, drawn by ropes which are held by the personifications of lust, greed, and anger. He follows her down the steps. At the bottom, he is reaching for Maya and gliding towards hell. So this is how Maya acts. This is how she... Uh, allures us. She promises us the world, but in the end, it's only pain she brings. Okay, let's go to 16. Dvau bhuta sargao loke smin daiva asura evacha daivo vistara shatrokta asuram partha meshrunu not 16, but 6, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's read the translation. O son of Partha, in this world, there are two kinds of created beings. One is called divine and the other demoniac. I've already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demoniac. So there are two kinds of created beings, divine and demoniac. Krishna is dividing into two. If one is not divine, then one is demoniac. If one is not demoniac, then one is divine. And he's explaining now, he says that now I'm going to explain to you about the demoniac because he has already explained about the divine quality. So starting from next verse up to verse 18, Krishna is going to at length describe the demoniac qualities. Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that both demigods and demons are born of Prajapati. So we remember Kashyapa Muni and his uh, wives Aditi and Diti. The wives of Aditi are the Adityas or the Devatas or the demigods, and the wives of Diti are the demons or the Daityas. I, I mean, 
the children of Aditi are the Adityas and the children of Diti are the Daityas or the demons. So they are both born from the same father. They are both born from the Prajapati. Prajapati, the word Prajapati means a parent or an ancestor or a progenitor from whom people originate. So Prabhupada explains that both demons are demons are originating from the same Prajapati, from the same Kashyapa Muni. The father is the same. So what is the differentiation between the two? Whether they are obeying or following the regulative principles of Shastra. If one is following the Shastra, then one is divine. If one is not following the Shastra, then one is demoniac. So now we come to the next section here. Krishna is going to explain in detail about the demoniac from 7 to 18. Let's see. Pravrittim cha nivrittim cha Janana vidura sura Nashau cham na picha charo Nasatyam te shu vidyate Those who are demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Neither cleanliness nor proper behavior nor truth is found in them. So Krishna is describing demoniac nature and he says that the demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Why? Because they are in mode of ignorance. They do not know what is um, what is shastric and what is not shastric. And neither are they clean, nor do they have proper behavior, nor are they truthful. Let's read points from the purpose. Focus of learning, purpose 16.7. Don't know what is to be done and not to be done. Do not follow Shastras. Acts whimsically and not according to set of uh, scripture, uh, scriptural rules and regulations and set up for a civilized society. Either do not know uh, scriptural rules uh, and regulations, even if he knows, has no inclination to follow, lack of faith in Vedas, no faith in Vedic injunction in sages do not accept any instructions or experiences of great sages. This causes miserable social condition of demoniac people. Aryans, they are the most advanced civilized people and they adopt the Vedic injunctions as it is. So acting whimsically is because they do not know the Shastra. And even if they know the Shastra, they do not follow the Shastra. So that is demoniac nature. Just like Ravan. Ravan was, uh, uh, I mean, theoretically, he knew the Shastra. He had even memorized, I, I understand, all the shlokas. He knew all the Vedas by memory. So theoretically, he knew, but he did not put it into practice. So that is also uh, demoniac nature. And Srila Prabhupada explains what does the word Aryan mean? The word Aryan, Prabhupada explains, is, is used to refer to anyone who follows Shastra because people who follow what the scriptures allow you to do, then they are the most civilized people. And that's the, uh, and Aryans is, uh, the word Aryan is used to refer to such people who adopt uh, Vedic injunctions. Four points from the purpose. Uh, purpose 16.7 continued unclean he neither likes nor follow these rules external cleanliness brushing shaving bathing etc internal cleanliness chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra then C is the improper behavior Manu Sahita is the guide for human behavior especially Hindus follow it improper behavior with others showing harshness and anger Manu Sahim Samhita explains the law or laws of inheritance and other legalities also. Examples of proper social behavior. Women, sh women should not be given freedom. Women are protected in all ages, not as slaves, but as children. Result of modern women liberation. Moral condition of women is not very good and marriage is practically an imagination. The untruthful. Uh, concoct uh, philosophies for their own purposes. So see, Srila Prabhupada explains here, we should not misunderstand. Women should not be given freedom. Now, that doesn't mean that women should be treated as slaves. 
it means that they should be given protection. Just as how we don't give children freedom because children uh, may be misguided, children are not so intelligent, children are very innocent and uh, very gullible. Therefore, we protect our children. Now, we teach our children so many things that don't do this, don't go here. We don't send them alone to so many places because we feel that there is danger outside. In the same way, women should be given protection. Why? Because women are more ruled by their heart, whereas the men are ruled by their head. So because women are more emotionally inclined, it's easier for men to manipulate the women. It's easier for women to be cheated and therefore women should be given all protection. That is the Vedic civilization, that women should be protected. But that doesn't mean that women should be treated as slaves. Women were given the highest respect in the Vedic society. In the modern day age, we see that, there is, that because of uh, the so-called women's liberation movement, the condition of the women is not very good. Women are, are uh, most exploited now in the current age where women's liberation is most talked about, isn't it? Than they were exploited in the uh, previous ages. In the Vedic society, one would not hear so much uh, uh, about the exploitation of women as one is hearing about now. In the name of liberation, actually the, the condition of the women is getting more and more uh, degraded. Marriage is practically an imagination. So in the name of women's liberation, there is no marriage taking place. Men and women, they live together. Then what happens? The woman is pregnant and the man runs away. Because anyway, there is no marriage. No, there is no, there is no responsibility that is taken officially to maintain the family. So therefore, who is, who is left behind? It's the woman who is now left behind with the children. She has to bring the children up alone. And the, therefore, the condition of the women has actually come down in the name of liberation. The woman has actually lost her liberation because now she has the added responsibility of taking care of the child, whereas the man has gone away. In most cases, it's like that we see, especially here in the Western world. So therefore, women should be given protection. That is the uh, Vedic system. I was just uh, reading last night about how in the 1920s in the United States, there was this campaign to introduce cigarette smoking to women because these cigarette companies had uh, completely exhausted the market. All the men that they could get into their network so that they can smoke and they, they can sell their cigarettes, they have already exhausted that market of the men. The women were not smoking. So now they wanted to exploit that market and they wanted women to start smoking so that they can increase their sales. So therefore they started advertising. If you just Google this, very interesting, you can see the posters and advertisements and all that and how cigarettes were at that time campaigned as torches of freedom. And they connected the freedom of women with cigarette smoking. So it was uh, it was advertised that cigarette smoking is a sign of uh, a woman who's liberated, a woman who's modern, a woman who's in society. Mm? Uh, they say, and also they advertise cigarettes as the in thing for controlling the weight. So there was this uh, catch line that I was reading last night that instead of reaching out for a sweet, then you reach out for this particular cigarette. That cigarette brand name was given. I don't remember the brand name now. So, you know, it was advertised like that. And therefore, what happened as a result of this campaign, they, you know, it was it was ingrained in the in the minds of the women that, yes, cigarette smoking is cool. It's a it's a mark of being free or being liberated. So therefore, because of these efforts, by the end of 1920s, the cigarette sale tripled. Hmm? Data says that the cigarette sale tripled by the end of 1920s. And by the end of 1930s, it tripled even more. Hmm? Again, it went three times more. So therefore, these uh, campaigns are all done in order to exploit the women in the name of liberation, because that's what suits that particular section of the society. But we should not fall for it. Okay, 16.8. Asatyama Pratishtam De Jagadahura Nishwaram Aparaspara Sambhutam Imanyat Kama Haitukam. They say that this world is unreal with no foundation, no God in control. They say that it is produced of sex desire and has no cause other than lust. 
So here Krishna is explaining, explaining the demoniac philosophy. Their philosophy is that there is no cause and effect. Uh, everything has come into existence on its own. There is no controller. There is no purpose behind why this material world exists. Actually, they have no concept of spirituality, spiritual, the Lord, super soul, karma. They don't, uh, they, they don't understand any of these concepts. Everything has come into existence by chance. Hmm? There is no controller. And they believe that um, uh, they have their own theory. That everything, for example, the body is nothing but a combination of matter. So there is no concept of the spirit soul existing in the body. So this is the philosophy of the demoniac. Ketam drashtima vashtabhya nashtatmanol pabudhaya Prabhavantyugra karmanaha Kshayaya jagato hitaha Following such conclusions, the demoniac who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So following such conclusions, what conclusions? The fact that there is no God in control. There is no supreme controller. So following such conclusions, the demoniac, what do they do? They are, they are engaging in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So they are all, their focus is how can we eat better? How can we sleep better? How we can mate better? And how we can defend better? That's the reason why uh, eating. <laughs> Uh, there is so much importance given to what we can eat, how to prepare, so many restaurants, eateries, all these things are there. No? So how we can eat better, how we can sleep better. There are so many sleeping pills, so many um, uh, therapies nowadays introduced so that we can sleep better, different kinds of uh, cushions and beds and so many different kinds of pillows are available in the market. How to sleep better, how to mate better. So much is being discussed and spoken and also researched on how we can get more and more pleasure out of mating. How can we get maximum pleasure and how we can defend better. The, so many uh, atomic weapons are being piled up by so many different countries. Hmm? So how we can defend better. The whole focus nowadays is how we can uh, increase our sense gratification more and more. Why? Because they do not believe in the concept of that there is a supreme controller. So they are engaged in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. So when there is, uh, when these atomic weapons are used and when there is this widespread animal killing, they are uh, they are destroying the world so much. No? Because of meat eating, there is so much of pollution and uh, nature is uh, greatly affected and also atomic weapons the use of atomic weapons we all now we can see currently in the war how it is affecting um, practically the entire world now is, is uh, beginning to feel the after effects of this war so these people these demoniac uh, uh, people they are engaged in unbeneficial horrible works which are destroying the world krishna says Kamamashritya Dushpuram Dambhamana Madanvitaha Mohad Grihitva Sadgrahan Pravartante Shuchivradaha Taking shelter of insatiable lust and absorbed in the conceit of pride and false prestige, the demoniac thus illusioned are always worn to unclean work, attracted by the impermanent. So taking shelter of insatiable lust. So insatiable, the lust can never be satisfied. One can never, uh, one may think that, okay, when I collect so much money, when I have so much bank balance, then I will stop working. Then I will retire. Then I will focus on spirituality is what most people say. No? But lust can never be satisfied. When one has certain, um, whatever the person wanted to possess, then he wants more and more and more because lust burns like the forest fire. There is no end to it. So taking shelter of insatiable lust, absorbed in the conceit of pride and false prestige, what do these demoniac people do? They are illusion. They are, they are under the influence of Maya. 
and therefore they are sworn to unclean work attracted by the impermanent they are attracted by that which is not permanent no they want beauty fame wealth whatever it is whatever one gathers but really it is impermanent because one uh, when death strikes everything is taken away from us so therefore they are attracted by the impermanent this again krishna is describing the mentality of the demoniac what is their mentality चिंताम परिमेया प्रलयाताश्रिता कामोपोग परमादी निश्चिता आशा पाशतर्बद्धा काम क्रोधपरायण ईहंते काम भोगाचया they believe that to graffiti the senses gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization thus until the end of life their anxiety is immeasurable bound by a network of hundreds of thousands of desires and absorbed in lust and anger they secure money by illegal means for sense gratification So eleven and twelve, these verses are describing the demoniac attitude and the engagements of the demoniac. What is the attitude of the demoniac? They believe that to gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization. This is the attitude of the demoniac. Somehow or the other, I want to gratify my senses. That is their whole goal. That is their and the whole focus of their lifetime is how can I gratify the senses better? So this is their mentality, and for this they are even in. engaged in unclean work no krishna mentioned the previous verse that they are engaged in see here they are sworn to unclean work what is this unclean work those the same four principles they are engaged in meat eating intoxication illicit sex and gambling so so just because their whole prime necessity is to gratify the senses therefore this is what uh, is their attitude and therefore they engage in what is their engagement secure money by illegal means or sense gratification because they want to gratify the senses they have no problem even securing money by illegal means they are unaware of the uh, presence of the super soul in their hearts see when a robber is robbing he looks you no know, left right he looks if nobody is looking at me and then he robs but he is not aware that in the in his heart the super soul is present who is witnessing his activities that's the he, the super soul is the most important witness of all his activities isn't so even though somebody around may not physically see him but yes his activity is recorded there is a witness for his activity but because they do not understand super soul they do not understand parmatma they do not understand lord then in order to gratify the senses they even resort to illegal means now in the next uh, three verses 13 14 and 15 krishna is going to talk about what are the thoughts of these demoniac uh, people who acquire money by illegal means what is it that they are thinking what is their thought process ida madhyamaya labdham himam prapye manoratham ida masti idam abime bhavishyati punardhanam असौ मया हत शत्रुर्निष्ये चापरानपीश्वरोहमहम भोगी सिद्धोहम बलवांसुखी आढ़्योभिजनवान्मी होन्योस्ति सदृशो मया यक्षे दास्या मोदिश्य इन विमोहिता uh the demoniac person thinks so much wealth do i have today and i will gain more according to my schemes so much is mine now and it will increase in the future more and more he is my enemy and i have killed him and my other enemies will also be killed i am the lord of everything i am the enjoyer i am perfect powerful and happy I'm the richest man, surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is no none so powerful and happy as I am. 
I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity, and thus I shall rejoice. In this way, such persons are deluded by ignorance. So Krishna is describing uh, further the mentality of a demoniac person. What is this person thinking? That I am the Lord of everything. I am the enjoyer. I am happy. I am perfect. I am powerful. I am the richest. Hmm? So this is how um, he's thinking. And see there, surrounded by aristocratic relatives. So we see also nowadays, if uh, even if you want to invite somebody home as a um, home, then... Uh, Usually in the social circles, uh, the cream of the society is 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 together, and and usually uh, the the billionaires don't want to mingle with the millionaires. The the crorepati don't want to mingle with the lakpati because they think this is low society, high society. That is the concept that exists. But what is a devotee thinking? A devotee is not thinking about lakpati and crorepati. He knows that he has to be the some be the humble servant of husband of Lakshmi Pati. Hmm? Krishna is the husband of the goddess of fortune. And that is what is important to be the servant of Lakshmi Pati. Instead of focusing on I am the richest man, I should be surrounded by aristocratic relatives. These things are not important. That is demoniac mentality. Uh, and then what does this uh, demon think that I shall perform sacrifices, I shall give some charity and thus I shall rejoice. So he is thinking that, okay, let me do all kinds of nonsense and then I will do some charity work. I will do some yagyas and I will be saved. I will not, I don't have to pay for that karma. He's thinking like that. But the law of karma doesn't work like that. Law of karma is if I hit someone and somebody else hits me back, that doesn't mean that the karma is negated. The karma for that is paid how? Then I have to be hit by somebody else and that other person who hit me back out of retaliation, he also should be hit by somebody else. Then only the karma is negated. So that's how the law of karma works. We cannot uh, negate karma ourselves by retaliating in a certain way. So this demonic person thinks that, okay, by giving some charity and giving doing some yagyas, then I, I will be happy. I can do all kinds of nonsense and these things will save me. No, it's not going to save him. He still has to pay for the karma. Aneka chitta vibhranta moha jala samavrataha prasaktaha kama bhogeshu patanti narakeshu chaum Thus perplexed by various anxieties and bound by a network of illusions, they become too strongly attached to sense enjoyment and fall down into hell. So here Krishna is explaining the results of the demoniac work. And what is the result that he's explaining is that they are perplexed by various anxieties. Why are they perplexed by various anxieties, first of all? is because, again, there is no end to sense gratification. So therefore, they're always going through anxieties. Oh, I want more, I have to work hard, I have to get this, I have to get that. So they are always perplexed by anxieties and bound by a network of illusions. See that word mohajal Krishna uses in the Sanskrit. So he's bound by a network of illusions because he's enamored by the positions that he has. And he believes in, oh, in my own hard work. If I work hard, then I will do this. But he does not understand the concept of karma. He does not understand the concept of uh, past uh, activities that are bringing me. If I'm uh, living a materially uh, comfortable life and somebody else is not, it's again got to do with our karma from our previous life. Hmm? A lot of people work very hard. The person, well, person who's working in the construction, he is working harder than the person who's working in the office in an air conditioned uh, room, but still he's earning more than the person who's breaking bricks and working in the construction over there. So this uh, the, uh, demoniac person, he's perplexed by various anxieties and he's bound by a network of illusions because he does not understand um, uh, the law of karma so they become strongly attached to sense enjoyment and that leads to what what is the result of the demoniac work it leads to him falling down into hell he gets a downgrade and uh, yeah it's the the path leads him to hell Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that how the demons they manufacture their own their own process for elevation just as how Ravan he proposed to build a staircase to heaven. Let's read about that here. 
Ravana's proposed staircase to heaven. Uh, morning walk, May 16, 1975, Perth. Devotee, for, devotee uh, just like Ravana, could not reach the heavenly planets just by building the staircase. So Prabhupada replied, that, that was his only demonic, demonic proposal that we make staircase. He said that why you are undergoing too much, why you are undergoing so much austerities to go to the heavenly planets. I shall make a staircase. You will go. Then the devotee Amoga, how high did he make it? Prabhupada answers. He never attempted. He simply bluffed. That's all. So demons' proposals are like that. So the demons, they come up with their own philosophy of how we can get elevated. Just as how Ravan said, okay, why do you want to work so hard in order to go to heaven? I will build a staircase. You can go to heaven. Even now we see, you know, the scientists are working towards uh, uh, reaching out to the other planets. But the only way we can get elevated and go to the higher planetary system is when we, when we desire it and when we deserve it according to our activities. We cannot artificially attain a higher planetary system. That's not possible. 17. Atma Sambhavita Stabha Dhanamana Madanvita Yajante Nama Yajjainste Dambhe Navidhi Purvakam Self complacent and always imprudent, deluded by wealth and false prestige, they sometimes proudly perform sacrifices in name only without following any rules or regulations. So here Krishna is talking about the hypocritical religious observances of the demoniac. Why are they hypocritical? Because see what uh, Krishna says that they are performing sacrifices in the name only. So sometimes they may engage in yagyas, they do yagyas, but just for the sake of doing the yagyas without following any rules or regulations. So the, I do it my way. I do it the way I think is correct. So therefore they are also hypocrites. Self-complacent and always impudent. Self-complacent means that they are satisfied with their position and always impudent means they are always foolish, always unwise and they are deluded by wealth and false prestige. That the wealth and the prestige that they have that covers their intelligence and they are performing yagyas thinking that, oh, I do it the way I want to do it. That's the disease that we have even now in the modern world. So many things are done. So much of logic is applied you know, oh, I think it's okay once in a while to have a glass of whiskey. It doesn't do any harm. Even my doctor suggested that it's okay once in a while. Everything should be done within the limits. So once in a while, it's okay to engage in meat eating. Once in a while, it's okay. You're young, so you have to have fun with members of the opposite sex. So it's okay once in a while just to take precautions. So these, this kind of logic and um, it's, it's um, that's what Krishna is explaining, that they do they want to follow something, but without following the rules and regulations. So they come up with their own their own rules and regulations. But no, what is uh, what is shastric? What is what is taught by a bonafide spiritual master that remains untouched, that remains pure, and that's why Srila Prabhupada was able to make so many devotees because he did not water down the philosophy. He always kept it pure. If Srila Prabhupada would have um, not maintain the purity of his teachings according to Shastra, then it would have not appealed so much and he would have not been able to make so many devotees all over the world. He may have had more followers because people usually they want uh, a cheap guru because they want to uh, 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 engage in so much of nonsense. Now, now we have, especially in India, we see so many of these so-called self-proclaimed godmen are, are in the prison house. Because later they are exposed in some scam, you know, some uh, or some aspect of their life is exposed, and then they are in jail. Why? Because uh, Prabhupada explained that this is a society of the cheaters and the cheated. The the self proclaimed Godman he is cheating, and the people who are who are getting cheated are getting cheated because they want a cheat guru. They want a guru who is going to. Uh, allow them to do nonsense, right? They say, okay, I will give you initiation, cheap initiation. You can continue to engage in uh, sinful activity. I will take care. Don't worry. So 
so the person who's getting cheated is getting cheated because he wanted a cheat guru because he wanted to follow uh, uh, he wanted to uh, engage in sinful activity but he's thinking that oh i have a guru so i'm safe just to have a just just because one has a so called guru doesn't mean one is safe the guru has to be bona fide the guru has to be authorized the guru should belong to a bona fide disciplic succession and most importantly the guru should not concoct the philosophy just to have some followers so this is a society of the cheaters and the cheater shrila prabhupada explains so we cannot follow our own rules and regulations according to our whims and fancies that is demoniac mentality अहंकारं बलं दर्पं कामं क्रोधं च संश्रितात्मपरदेहेशु प्रद्विषंतोभ्यसूयका Bewildered by false ego, strength, pride, lust and anger, the demons become envious of the supreme personality of Godhead, who is situated in their own bodies. and in the bodies of others and blasphemy against the real religion so krishna is further describing the hypocritical nature and preaching of these demoniac people so first of all bewildered by false ego strength pride lust and anger the demons become envious of the supreme personality of god what is the reason that the uh, demons are envious is because they are accumulating more and more wealth more and more power and they have no spiritual knowledge so therefore they are becoming envious and because they are becoming envious of the lord then what are they doing they are blaspheming the lord who is situated in so the lord is is present in their own body as the paramatma but they are blaspheming the lord out because they are envious and because they lack spiritual knowledge they are blaspheming the lord and they are blaspheming against the real religion they are blaspheming or talking against sanatan dharma so again the hypocritical nature of the uh, demons krishna is describing in this verse so a sample of the demoniac qualities so with this krishna ends this discussion on the demoniac qualities and you can see in this picture how somebody here is lusty here greedy here anger here he is engaged in animal uh, slaughter here this person is envious towards the devotees so like that you can see the demoniac qualities in this picture let's go to 19 लाइफ So, in nineteen and twenty, Krishna is going to talk about his reciprocation with the demoniac, or what is the fate of the demoniac. So, Krishna is saying that what is the fate, what is the destination, is that they are cast into various demoniac species of life. And who does this? Krishna says, "I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence into various demoniac species of life." So, this is how Krishna is reciprocating with the demons. so um if one is taking birth in an animal species or somebody is born as a dog if somebody is born as a pig if uh, somebody is born as a worm in the stool it's not by chance krishna says that i cast such people into the different different species of life so it's not that um uh, it just happened i mean without a control Okay, let's go to to Attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, O son of Kunti, such persons can never approach me. gradually they sink down to the most abominable type of existence 
So say Krishna is calling them as mudhas, foolish. These foolish people then janmani, janmani, birth after birth. They are uh, taking, I mean, repeatedly they are, they are taking birth amongst the species of demonic life and they can never approach me, Krishna says. So again, Krishna is describing what is the destination of such people. They sink down to the most abominable type of existence. They are gliding to hell. Trividham narakasyedam varam nashanam atmanaha kama krodhas tatha lobhaha tasmade tatrayam tyajed. There are three gates leading to this hell lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give up these, should give these up for. Uh, give this up for they lead to the degradation of the soul so one may after reading all these demoniac qualities one may think that okay i don't want to uh, i i i i don't want to go to hell i don't want to glide down to the lowest condition of life so what should i do so therefore krishna says that if you don't want to uh, go to the abominable, abominable species then you have to avoid three things. What are the three things? Lust, anger, and greed. Krishna says every sane man should give up these three things. Why? Because these are the three gateways to hell. So, so Krishna says lust, anger, and greed are the three gates that lead to hell. They lead to the degradation of the soul. Therefore, it's very mm -hmm. important to give this up. Let's read this text. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You said every sane man. So that means someone who has greed, anger, and lust. Is he insane? Yes, he is insane because he is in the mode of ignorance. He has no spiritual knowledge, and it's it's uh, if he's in the mode of passion and ignorance, then then he's like a madman. I mean, who would want to pur purposely uh, lead a, a life where he's going to go to hell? Where he's going to get degraded. Who would want that? Even so even insane. if a person is doing book distribution and doing Harinam Sankirtan? No, if, if somebody is doing book distribution, Harinam Sankirtan, he's a devotee, he is engaged in devotional service. So where is the question of lust, anger, and greed? If he's going out on book distribution, where is he greedy? Where is he lusty and where is he angry? That person is uh, still earning money more and more, though that person is like very like in the age of 66 and he, he's lusty because he's doing illicit sex and he has uh, anger because he gets ang angry like every like three, two minutes. Okay, so see, um, you are talking about a person who is neither completely black nor completely white. So he has some element of lust, some element of anger, some element of greed, but at the same time, he's engaged in devotional service. So what you're talking about is a gray area. Okay, In this chapter, Krishna, Krishna is making only two categories. He says that those who are not demons, they are devotees, and those who are not devotees, they are demons. Now, coming to this gray area that what you're talking about, that is what is our connection with chapter 16 and chapter 17, okay? Because in chapter 17, Arjuna asked that question, what about those people who are in between, neither completely black nor completely white? So for that, Krishna answers, we have the entire next chapter coming up for that, okay? Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, let's read this text. People hearing this are going to want to give up these qualities. What can they do to accomplish this is the next question. Krishna answers. Give up the three gates to hell, lust, anger and greed. Why? Because they lead to degradation of the soul to such an extent that there will be no possibility of liberation from this material entanglement. So you, as you can see on the right, there these are the three gates leading to the hell, lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up for they lead to the degradation of the soul. Okay, let's see here. We can see how lust, anger, and greed is, is uh, 
leading a person to degradation. He is going down and down in the uh, deeper and deeper in the ocean of material existence. So he is gliding towards hell. Let's go to 22. Ketair vimukta kaunteya tamo dvara istribhir naraha acharatyatmana sheya tato yati param gatim The man who has escaped these three gates of hell, O son of Kunti, performs acts conductive to self-realization and thus gradually attains the supreme destination. So, see, Krishna in 21 spoke about avoiding lust, anger, and greed. He said that these are three gateways to hell. Why we should give up lust, anger, and greed? Krishna is explaining in 22. He is saying that one who escapes lust, anger, and greed, then he performs acts conducive to self-realization. So, automatically he is engaged in those activities. Automatically he will be engaged in activities that will um, help purify his existence. And the more he purifies himself, then the more it will be easier for him to follow the rules and regulations of the Shastra, to follow the rules and regulations of devotional service. And therefore, then he can rise to the platform of Krishna consciousness. So it's important to give up last anger and need because these acts are conducive for self-realization. It leads to purification. And again, the more one is purified, the more one can follow the rules and regulations and one can be elevated to the level of Krishna consciousness. Yashastra vidhi mutsrujya vartate kama karataha nasa siddhim avapnoti nasukham na param gatim He who discards scriptural injuk injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination in the last two verses of this chapter 23 and 24 krishna focuses on the importance of following the uh, vedic injunctions the importance of following shastra instead of uh, following what we want to i mean following one's own impulses Instead of following your own impulses, Krishna says that you must follow the Shastra. So that's what Krishna is focusing on in 23 and 24. So he says here, one who discards Shastra and acts according to his own whims. Own whims means I do what I like to do. He has no concern for Shastra or Guru or Sadhu. So such a person, he does not attain perfection. Perfection in the sense that what is the perfection of human life? What is the perfection of human life? To attain love of God. So such a person, he can neither attain perfection nor happiness. Why he can never attain happiness is because if he is going to do things according to his own whims, then he has to pay the karma for his activities. So he can never be happy. One can be real happiness is only when we uh, regain or we, uh, we, we connect ourselves with the Lord or we regain the lost um, regain that which we have forgotten our position as the servants of Krishna only then we can be really happy until then we are only like the fish out of the water we are not in our natural habitat this material world is not our natural habitat our natural habitat is the spiritual world so unless we are uh, there we cannot be happy so such a person can attain neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination nor can we attain the highest planet Let's see the last shloka of this chapter. Tasma chastram pramanam te kadya kadya vyabasthito yatva shastra vidhanoktam karma kartumi harhasi om tatsaditi simad bhagavad gita supanishatsu brahma vidyayam yoga shastre. Sri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Daiva Sura Sampad Vibhaga Yoga Nama Shoda Shodhyaya And with this we finish chapter 16. Yes. One should 
one should therefore understand what is duty and what is not duty by the regulations of the scriptures. Knowing such rules and regulations, one should act so that he may gradually be elevated. So Krishna is saying that you have to make a choice. You act, but you act after you understand what is the Shastra is saying, after you take guidance from the scriptures, then you can make your decision. So if, I, if an individual is going to make a choice about how to conduct his life without taking any guidance from the Shastra, it is as absurd and as dangerous as a patient who decides to take a particular treatment for his disease without knowing the pros and cons of the different kinds of treatments that are available for his disease. Whether I should go in for an operation or whether I should just take some tablets or whether I should go for Ayurveda or I should take. So there are so many choices. If one has a disease that there are so many choices and we have to make a choice after studying the pros and cons, isn't it? So like that Krishna is saying that you have to act, you make a choice, but after you take guidance from the scriptures. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, now it's up to you. I have given you knowledge. Now it's up to you what you want to do. Now he leaves it to Arjuna to take a decision after he has received this knowledge. So Krishna does not force anyone. We have to make a choice. Bhagavad Gita is a book of choices, but we have to make the choice. We have to act after we take knowledge from the Shastra. That is important. So Krishna is focusing on how we have to take knowledge from the Shastra. The importance of following Shastra is what Krishna focuses on in the last two verses. Now see, when we make choices, we may make choice, uh, we may make a choice depending on so many factors. One may be the mood. I feel like doing something, therefore I do it. I Today I feel like eating meat. So just because I feel like it, I'm in the mood, therefore I choose to eat meat. Or on some other day, I may say logic, it makes sense. Well, the doctor also said that if I don't eat meat, then I will lack protein and I need protein in my body. Therefore, logic says, the doctor says, and it's only logical that yes, we need protein. So therefore I will engage in meat eating. Fashion, everyone is doing it. Just because it's the in thing, everybody around me is doing it. It's cool to have a glass of whiskey in a, in a high status society. So therefore, I will also drink. It's okay once in a while. It doesn't matter. Everyone is doing it. So I also want to, I don't want to uh, be the odd one out. So therefore, I also will engage. Tradition. We have always done it. It has been our family tradition that once a month, we go to the Kali temple and we slaughter a goat. And my family has been doing it for so many years. Um, so many years therefore i will also do or it's a family tradition that on diwali we will definitely pay, play cards we will definitely gamble on diwali so it's a family tradition the family gets together on diwali and we have to play at least one game uh, one gambling match it's a tradition emotions sometimes we are run by emotions of fear friendship false prestige and we like that see for example in the case of uh, kai 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 want, took this decision. She chose that Ram should be banished and that her son should be crowned king because she was fearful. She feared that if Ram is crowned king, then her, his mother, Kaushalya, will be given prime importance in the kingdom and I, may, I, may, I will be treated like a maidservant. So she had that fear. That's what, that's, it was that uh, emotion that drove her to making the choice of telling her husband that I want Ram to be banished or friendship. In the case of friendship, Karna chose his friendship with Duryodhan. He made that choice because he said, okay, my friendship with Duryodhan, um, I cannot give up. Even though Krishna personally, personally he went and he spoke to Karna and he, he told him that you give up Duryodhan and you join the Pandavas. And he told him that you will be crowned king. You will be respected as the uh, eldest brother. Even Draupadi will in course of time approach you as a wife. Hmm? He even told him that. But still Karna chose that. Okay, because my friendship with Duryodhan is, is more important. So he made a choice. So like that, out of emotions also, one may make a choice. Or one may make a choice depending on what is in the Shastra. Because Krishna wants me to do this, therefore I choose to do this. Because Krishna wanted Arjuna to fight, therefore Arjuna chose to fight the war. So 
if we have a lighthouse that is always moving and on the other side there is another lighthouse which is immovable which never moves which of the two lighthouses is going to give proper guidance to the ships in the sea the one that is moving or one that is immovable the immovable the immovable lighthouse the movable lighthouse will only cause confusion for the for the ship because if it's always moving then how will the one know that where should i go so an immovable lighthouse only can guide appropriately so out of these uh, options that we have given about mood logic fashion tradition emotions and scripture which do you think is immovable scripture is immovable exactly is Yes, scripture is immovable, right? We, Sanatan, the word Sanatan Dharma means that which never changes. It is eternal. Sanatan means eternal. So it is always the same. It remains eternal. So mood can change, logic can change, fashion, tradition, emotions can also change, but scripture never changes. So it is the scripture that will give us proper guidance. All others can cause confusion and failure. So therefore, make scripture as the first and the last deciding factor in all the decisions that we make. On that note, we come to the summary of the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Let's read the summary. The divine and the demoniac natures. Summary. Verses 1 to 3. In this chapter, Krishna describes and compares two kinds of qualities and those who possess them. The divine or transcendental devic qualities in the mode of goodness are conducive to spiritual progress. The demoniac asuric qualities in the modes of passion and ignorance conversely are detrimental to spiritual progress and they lead to lower birth and further material bondage. Those who possess divine qualities live regulated lives abiding by the authority of scripture and attain perfection, while those possessing demoniac qualities act whimsically without reference to scripture and are bound up by material nature. First, Krishna lists 26 transcendental qualities born of the godly atmosphere. Verses 4 to 5, these qualities, as previously mentioned, are auspicious for progress on the path of liberation from the material world. Krishna then gives Arjuna a synopsis of the qualities of the demoniac like arrogance, pride, anger, conceit, harshness, and ignorance. Krishna states that the transcendental qualities lead to liberation. Whereas the demoniac qualities lead to bondage, he, he assures Arjuna that he need not worry, for he has been born with transcendental qualities. Krishna thus encourages Arjuna by indicating that Arjuna's involvement in the battle is not demoniac, for he is not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. According to the scriptural injunctions, Governing his social order, fighting in a religious war, religious war, war. war is godly activity, whereas refraining from such duty would be demoniac or irreligious. Accordingly, is gradually elevated to spiritual perfection. Verses 6 to 18. Krishna then gives a graphic description of the demoniac. Essentially, the demoniac are atheists, are materialists, who violate the, script, the scriptural injunctions guiding human behavior, both socially and spiritually. Such persons conceive the world to have no foundation or purpose, and thus they tend toward whimsical and destructive activities. For them, the ultimate goal of life is gratification of the senses. They are attracted by impermanent material things, bound by multitudinous material desires. They obtain money by any means. They are conceited, lusty, complacent, and impudent, and the, there is no end to their anxiety. Verses 19 to 20. Such demoniac person take birth, 
in various lower species of life and sink down to the most abominable position of existence wherein they can never approach krishna verses 21 to 22 every sane man krishna cautious should give up lust anger and greed the three gates leading down to hell by escaping these one can elevate oneself to self realization and the supreme destination verses 23 to 24 krishna concludes by saying that one who lives whimsically without following the regulations of scripture meant to elevate a person to spiritual realization attains neither perfection nor happiness whereas one who understands vedic scriptural regulations and guides his life okay i think there is something missing there attains the supreme destination yeah krishna concludes by saying that one who lives whimsically without following the regulations of scripture neither attains neither perfection or happiness whereas one who understands the vedic scriptural regulations and guides his life attains the supreme, attains the supreme yeah. destination yes okay so i have to make that correction here anyway so with this by the mercy of guru and krishna by the mercy of shila prabhupad and uh, krishna we come to the end of chapter number 16 shila prabhupad ki jai shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai 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 what else do we have to discuss anything we need to discuss any questions mata ji yes mata ji um yeah, youtube how do i find you on youtube i can't find you on youtube yeah uh shri namarada is uh, the name of my youtube channel okay thank you and we also share the links in the group so those uh, recordings are on my youtube channel only okay okay uh, yeah you are in the group right lot to i actually am in the group but the thing is i don't have it up here i don't have the group um it's geeta sar right it's a uh, i think wait bhagavad gita systematic study oh i don't i don't have that no, yeah it says it says, it says geeta study i'm sorry here it is geeta study group slot 2 is the name of the group okay geeta study slot 2 i'm looking for it right now slot 2 you're in slot 2 okay i am but i don't have it up here though bhagavad gita reading no that's not it geeta no i don't it doesn't show here i i am in the group but in my post right here it doesn't show okay i'll i'll send you a message here okay thank you you're welcome yeah i hear you ashri hari s h r i there did you get the message um yes yes i have it now thank you yeah, so here i share all right what else anything else we need to discuss okay so next week uh, we will start with the second last chapter of the bhagavad gita where as i said krishna is explaining about the gray areas those who are neither completely demoniac nor completely divine so what about those who are com- neither completely black or white that arjuna wants to know about them so krishna explains that in the next chapter called divisions of faith and then after that we go to the last chapter of the bhagavad gita so till then have a nice week and uh, see you all next week krishna willing thank you very much hari krishna hari krishna mataji ji ne pranam hari krishna thank you hari krishna